please welcome to the stage Peter Shankman to talk about the economy of the next 50 years as it will be run by customer service. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Hilarious. Thanks. Oh, is that for us? Yeah, sure. That's for the two. All right, so ignore that title. I totally rewrote my speech this morning. Yeah, no, no, I'm not shitting you. I was on the bike this morning, and I had an experience last night, and I was in the gym this morning, and I'm like, fuck it, I'm rewriting my entire speech. So I did. Um, so the new speech, someone's going to win this. I'm not actually drinking on stage. I'm going to give it away. Um, the new speech is called, and I actually wrote it down, uh, 10 Ways to Not Suck and Win All the Things. And uh, I'll tell you why I came up with that. So real fast, housekeeping, my name is Peter Shankman. I'm at Peter Shankman on all the socials. Anything I say is public, tweet the shit out of it. And you don't have to hide your phone. I teach at a university. I know when my students are on their phone because no one has ever looked down at their crotch and smiled. So <laughs> say whatever you want. That's how to contact me. That's my actual cell phone number. It rings this very phone. Don't call me now because my ADHD will kick in and we won't get shit done. But text me anytime, reach out anytime. I'm that transparent because I believe you have to be. So why am I talking about this? The, the, the speech I'm going to give, it, it talks about the next 50 years of the economy will be run by customer service, but it's going to be, it's enveloped in the concept of not sucking. And here's why. How many of you flew here today? or flew here for this conference? How many of you had a good flight? Raise your hands if you had a good flight. What made it good? It was quick. Okay, they didn't let you fly the plane. There wasn't someone next to you that you could date. It was just, it was quick, right? You didn't crash in the, all right. She had a regular, you, you signed something called a contract of carriage when you bought your ticket which said, I will give you money and you will fly me from point A to point B at a certain time and date and that's what they did. Right? They didn't do anything special, but your hand went up like a rocket when I said who had a great flight. Oh my God, best flight ever, we didn't crash into a mountain. Okay, because what you expected, what we all expect when we travel, we get to the airport, if we don't have pre-check, we go on the line that looks the quickest, we get up to the front, everyone else has moved before us, we get up there, we get pulled for the anal probe. I know it's not just me. An hour after that's over, you know, we get, that's done, we exit that little room, and now, it's okay, we're at gate four, which is right there. We only have 20 minutes to make our flight, but we're at gate four, except they moved you to gate 472 without telling anyone, which is like four airports and like six states over. So now you're running, clothes are dragging behind you, like shit's falling out, whatever. You get to the gate, you've had four mini strokes, and they gave away your seat because you weren't there 20 minutes to start. Right, so now you went from seat 4A to 39 bathroom. <laughs> There's no room for what's left of your luggage. And you're sitting next to the two 400 pound guys on either side in the middle seat in the back row next to the bathroom, which overflowed and smells for the entire six hours. Welcome to fucking hell, that's your flight. So why are you so damn happy? Because it was quick and they did exactly what they said they'd do. All right, so what is the next 50 years of the economy? Well, if I'm sitting in the back in, in, in my bad seat now for six hours, you damn well know I'm writing a blog post about it. Okay, and more importantly, I don't need to write a blog post anymore. All I need to do is tweet something about how bad my airline sucked, or share something on Facebook, and then when you're booking a flight, you don't even have to look up my reviews anymore. Because the nature of the social economy is this. If I want to book a flight to Fiji or I want to go on vacation, I just type in flights to Fiji. You know what's going to show up? All my friends who have gone to Fiji and had a good time. Not the people who got screwed. So I'm going to see my friends who had a good time, I'm going to see what airlines they flew, what hotels they stayed at, not because they left reviews on Yelp. Yelp's dead in two years. But because, <laughs> but because the stuff they automatically share in the very commonality of living is what's going to be up there. When I fly to San Francisco and I land and I type in show me a steakhouse near me, sure, Google shows me the steakhouses near me. You know what it shows before that? It shows all the steakhouses my friends have been to and whether or not they had fun. So here's the awesome part of this conversation. I don't need you to be awesome. I just interviewed Tony Robbins uh, for a podcast that I run, and he's all about, you know, walk on fire and do that. He's awesome. I love him. But you know what? I don't need you to walk on fire. That shit's hard. You want to be the best possible thing you can do in your influencing career, in your social career? Here's the thing I need you to do. I need you not to suck. And not, here's the best part. I don't even need you to be good. I need you not to suck. I need you to suck a little less than what we expect. You ever heard the great joke? Uh, two guys are in the woods, and they, they're running in the woods on a training run, and they see a bear. And um, the first one says, holy shit, dude, it's a bear. The second one says, oh my god, did it kill us? First one 
ties, ties his lacing, like laces up his running sneakers tighter. Second one says, dude, don't be an idiot. You can't outrun a bear. He says, shit, shit, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you, OK? I just want you guys to suck a little less, and you will win all the things, all right? Here is 10 ways to suck a little less. This speech came to light yesterday when I was on the bike uh, at the gym downstairs. By the way, I went on the bike and I tweeted out with the IDFS hashtag, hey guys, I'm on the bike for the next hour. Anyone who wants to come pick my brain for an hour, um, feel free. Get free advice on whatever you want to talk about. You saw that, right? Why didn't you show up? <laughs> oh yeah, that was awesome. Didn't do you a lot of good. I know this. You know how I know this? Because you weren't there. I do this every time I'm in a city. I'm like, come talk to me. My freelance, look, I'm not, all this is predicated on you thinking I'm somewhat knowledgeable about something. I started a company called Harrow. I sold it. I started two other companies. I sold them. I like to think I know a little shit about a little shit. I'm not great by any stretch of the imagination. CC Chapman's closing out the conference. He's fucking great. Listen to him. But I know a little bit about a little bit, right? So if I'm offering to give that to you for free, why wouldn't you show up? Unless I really suck, which is quite possible. But long story short, I'm on, the, I'm on the bike and I get a call from this mortgage broker. I've been trying to refinance my uh, condo to take a home equity line to do like construction, re redo my bathroom and stuff in New York for six months now, okay? Problem is, I'm a consul I started and sold a company. I'm an entrepreneur. You know what happens when you're an entrepreneur and you go to a bank and you say, hey, I have all this money in the bank so I could do this myself but I'd like to take out a home equity line. They go, great, give us your W-2. You go, well, I don't actually have one because I'm an entrepreneur. And then you start the six month cycle of mortgage hell. Because if you're not just like everyone else, you can't get, it's a, it's a nightmare. So finally, six months in, we get, I get to the point where they've taken pictures of the apartment, they're ready to give me the money, and I'm not asking for a lot of money, right? And then I get this email. Um, this is a conversation I actually had with the mortgage broker and my assistant, Megan. Word for word, this happened yesterday. Mortgage broker, Peter, need insurance and condo fees on River Place. Uh, me, River Place is a rental. I, I don't own, I have an apartment there. It's a, it's a rental property. I don't think you mean that. Do you mean the Orion where I own? He's like, yeah, River Place. I'm like, again, River Place, not a rental building. You've been working with me for six months. He's like, oh, you don't own the whole building? Honest to God, these are my words. Are you seriously fucking asking me if I fucking own a 40-story, several hundred unit building when all I'm trying to get from you is a home equity line for $500,000? At which point my assistant stepped in and said, Alex, I'm going to call you right now. Peter, go enjoy your weekend. And then I said, this is why we can't I have nice things. And she said, Peter, hang up the phone right now. <laughs> the guy's been working with me for six months. Does he really? And all of a sudden it occurs to him that I might not own a 40-story building on the corner of 12th Avenue and 42nd Street in Manhattan? If I did, you think I'd really need him? Do your homework. Rule one of the top 10 ways to not suck. Do your homework. Know a little bit about me. It's not hard. Google is your friend. And screw it, not even about me. Anyone you're dealing with, do a little bit of research. The easiest bit of research is more than 99% of what people do. Be a little bit better. Rule two, listen to your audience. I travel 250,000 miles a year on United Airlines. I love United. I'm their bitch because I can't go anywhere else because they treat me really well. Okay, we're running late today. I'm on a 4.30 flight home. I call them like, hi, I'm running late. Can I get on the 5.30? They're like, yeah, no problem. I wouldn't be able to do that with any other airline, right? So I love them. I have to, they're a great airline. And they treat me really well, except one thing. At the end of every flight I take, I get an email the next day. I was like they're in their top 10 most frequent flyers last year, right? Every time I take a flight, I get an email, tell us about your flight. And they always say, oh yeah, the flight was awesome. No worries. Pretty, I loved it. Fine. At the last thing of their, the last line of this automated email, do not respond to us or we'll kill you, but we care about your opinion. They said, um, what can we do to make your next flight better? For 344 flights in a row, the last line of this survey has been the exact same thing. On my next flight, please refer to me as Peter, Lord of the Skies. Now, I don't ever expect them to do that, but you know what would be nice? After 344 flights in a row, I'd love a phone call from one of their people to say, hey, Peter, um, yeah, we're not going to do that shit. Shut up. <laughs> stop it. Just, just stop it. Okay? Because that tells me they're listening. Right? 344 responses in a row with the same thing, and I've not gotten one call back. Well, what does that tell you? Right? What happens if I do have five shitty flights in a row? Am I going to leave United? Probably not, but you know what? They've opened the door. By not responding, it makes me wonder if they're really genuine. And if they're not, well, now what's stopping Delta from coming to say, hey, we saw you tweeted out that you had a really bad three flights. How you doing? Anything we can do for you? We have drugs. Whatever. <laughs> They've opened that, United has opened that door. And all they had to do was just call me and say, don't be an idiot. We're not, we're never going to call you Lord of the Skies. That's it. That's rule two. Know your audience. Listen to them. Rule three, brand everything you do. Brand everything you do because we live in an age where people could steal your shit in five seconds. Anyone do triathlons in the audience? Raise your hand. Who's done a triathlon in the audience? Anyone? 
What's the longest distance? Uh, of the entire triathlon, about 50 miles. Okay, so a half Ironman? Okay, you know what, because I'm not going to argue with you, I'm going to give you this vodka. So here, this vodka's over here, it's yours, enjoy it. You did a half Ironman. Now, I did an Iron, I've done two Ironman in my life. Look at this, she's like gets up in the middle of the speech to get the vodka. <laughs> Love it. So I've done two Ironman in my life, I'm doing a third one this year, and I know you're looking at me and going, no, Peter, you're confused, you've sat on your ass and watched the movie Iron Man while eating popcorn, but no, I've really done two Ironman, and I was dating a woman at the time when I did my first one, um, who never understood why I could never like go out for dinner or like go to brunch, brunch is the thing, and um, it's always because I'm training, right? So I made a video, after, I did the Ironman, I got back, and we broke up, and I made a video about my experience training for an Ironman, and I posted it online, and I shared it with a couple of friends, and um, in sharing it, um, I didn't think anything of it. I totally forgot about it, because I have massive ADHD, which I'll talk about in a second. And I forgot about this video, and then, I check it a couple of days later and it had like 200 views and I check it the day after that and it had 12,000 and it's growing by leaps and bounds. And I tracked it back and it turns out Lance Armstrong had tweeted it. And this was before we knew he was made of chemicals, so we like, we trusted him? <laughs> and he tweeted, hey cyclists, check this out, really funny shit. And nowhere on this video did it say, hey, my name is Peter Shankman, for more, find me. No. Totally blew my shot. You have one shot. You cannot create anything viral. Stop trying to create viral shit. Create good shit. Create good stuff, it will go viral. Stop trying to create viral shit. So I want to play this for you. Um, now, why do I hit play? What do I hit? Just hit play? Do you want to go get some dinner? It's 6 o'clock. I can't. I have to go home to get to sleep. It's 6 o'clock. You are 38 years old. Why the hell do you have to go home and go to sleep? I'm training for an Iron Man. What the hell is an Iron Man? An Iron Man is a 2.4 mile swim, then a 112 mile bike ride, then a full 26.2 mile marathon, all within 17 hours. What the fuck is wrong with you? Nothing. This is fun for me. I have to go to sleep now so I can get up at 4 in the morning and train. You get up at 4 in the morning? 6 days a week. On Mondays I sleep in until 6 a.m. You're mentally retarded. So you go to sleep at 7 p.m. every night? Pretty much. How long do you train for this Iron Man? For about six months. You realize you are not going to have sex with anyone for six months? It is okay because I will be an Iron Man. So do you win money for finishing this Iron Man? No. Only the winners win money. I pay $700 to register, then I have to buy a plane ticket and fly there, and spend money to ship my bike there, and spend money for a hotel. But it is worth it. I will be an Iron Man. So you spend lots of money to never go out at night, not get laid for six months, all because you are going to sleep at 7 p.m. every night, so you can call yourself something that no one else would ever be stupid enough to do? But I will be an Iron Man. You are an idiot. I have to go home and go to sleep now. If you would like to join me at 4.30 in the morning for a bike ride, that would be fun. There is nothing fun about 4.30 in the morning. You are truly insane. Perhaps you would like to go for a run with me on Tuesday, then have a protein shake afterwards. We could do that. What time on Tuesday? 4.45 in the morning. Screw you. I'm going to dinner now. So, I made that and it just blew up. It has about two million views now on YouTube. Nowhere did it say find me. So I learned my lesson. Brand everything you do because if you create something and it's awesome and no one has a way to get back to you, well, what was the point, right? So brand everything you do. Um, transparency, for fuck's sake, be honest, okay? And it's very hard to be honest in the society politically charged in which we currently live. I get that. But the benefit of that is that when our country is led by someone who doesn't, and I'm not getting political, but when our country is led by someone who no one expects to be honest, being honest is like the easiest thing in the world to do, okay? And when you're honest, people believe you. The concept of transparency is unbelievable. In New York, uh, we had a guy about five years ago, I have four minutes left. I wasn't even on stage for like two seconds. I have a, there's a guy in New York City named Anthony Weiner. All he had to do when he was texting like those pictures, is Weiner, I get it, is just own it. Say, hey, you know what, I did this thing, sorry. Move on. We would have been like, it's funny, we'll laugh at you. We would have mocked him. It's required by New York City law. He'd be mayor right now. 
He kept the damn story alive for six months or six weeks by not owning it. When you screw up and you're going to, own your shit. Own it and you'll get through it. And then people who you've wronged after you fix the problem will love you. There is no greater lover in the world than a former hater. Fix your problem, fix their problem, they will love you. Relevance. Okay, if you have 140 characters to reach your audience, if you have 2.7 seconds to reach your audience, if you have a fractured audience who likes their news via newspaper, TV, radio, print, blogs, ask them how they like to get their information and give them their information the way they want it. I work for a nonprofit animal society, an animal shelter, who I, I found when I was skydiving, a friend of mine was killed in a base jump. I sent a check to this animal society as a donation in her name and they sent me a coffee table book, which I looked at and was like, why would you ever send me this? Why wouldn't you just send me a link that I could share? Oh, we believe most of our donors are older and they probably prefer a book. I'm like, oh, so you've done research. No, we just assumed. I'm like, okay, screw, screw this. And I joined their board. And <laughs> we spent the next year interviewing every current and past donor. And shock of shocks, 96% of them preferred their information online. So we started a YouTube page, a Twitter handle, a Facebook page, the whole thing. And donations went up 37% in a year. And they saved $500,000 on printing, mailing, and reproduction. For Christ's sake, ask your audience how they like to get their information. Give it to them the way they want. They'll become zombie loyalists. They'll become loyal to you. Um, brevity. You have 140 characters, become a better communicator. Learn to write, take a class, understand your audience, and don't automate if you don't know what the hell. If there's any chance of you screwing up an automation, don't automate. Okay, I get an email two weeks ago. Dear Peter, dear Peter, mothers like you have it really tough. <laughs> it's not that hard, people. All right, top of mind, guy named Barry Diller, he ran Paramount Pictures. His big thing when he ran Paramount Pictures was that he would go into the office every day, and Paramount was like two feet from bankruptcy in the 70s. He'd go in every day, he'd reach into his Rolodex. For those under 30, a Rolodex is like Outlook, but you'd turn it, it had cards. And he'd pull out 10 people in his Rolodex, call them every day and say, hey, what are you working on? What's the news? What are you doing? How can I help? Okay? When you had a, a, a 50, you know, a, 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 an actor you wanted to sign to a five-picture deal or a new movie you wanted, whatever, you just called Barry back. You didn't go to, Par to 20th Century Fox or Warner Brothers. You called Barry because he just called you. He was top of mind. Reach out to your audience without trying to sell them anything and ask them, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? Okay, that is top of mind. That's how people understand. Rule, I don't know what we're on, six. Differentiate yourself. Differentiate yourself because most people suck. Okay, in 1999, maybe 2000, I had wound up doing some work for Tony Bennett. And I was having a dinner. Tony Bennett, my mother, my father, Tony's beautiful 29-year-old girlfriend, and me. We walk into Nobu without a reservation, because Tony fucking Bennett, and we're having dinner. And at some point during the dinner, my mother got up to go to the bathroom. Okay, and Tony Bennett stood up for her when she got up to go to the bathroom. Me and my dad, you ever watch The Simpsons when they eat? Didn't even notice. She comes back from the bathroom. Tony Bennett stands up again, me and my dad, we leave, Tony Bennett and his, his beautiful girlfriend get into a car and they go their way. My mom, dad, and me are looking for a cab. My dad says, my God, that was an amazing meal. What a great day. I'm like, yeah, the food was so good. My mom's like, Tony Bennett stood up for me when I went to the bathroom and didn't talk to us for a week. All you have to do is be a little better. Stand up when someone goes to the bathroom. Stand up when someone enters the room. Shake hands. There is no wrong way to say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. None of us do it. How you treat, I know my time is up, but you got to give me three more minutes. He ran late. The air guitarist was awesome, ran late. As you, there is no better way, there's no wrong way to be a nice person. How you treat your staff, how you treat waitresses, how you treat waiters determines whether or not I hire you. Okay? Um, understand yourself, and I'll, I'll cut this short. I have two more. I have four more rules, but I'll give you two. Understand yourself. The reason I gave you Tito's vodka, which is a very nice gift in my room, is because 14 months ago I decided that I'm drinking too much. I didn't decide I was an alcoholic per se, but I decided that I was drinking too much. Why? Know yourself. I have massive ADHD. As a matter of fact, if any of you have ADHD in the room, I run the number one podcast for ADHD called Faster Than Normal. Check it out at fasterthannormal.com. We interview major people about having ADHD and why it's a gift. But you got to know yourself. I have massive ADHD. I don't do things slowly. Look at how much I've talked in 30, 26 minutes or whatever I had. Okay, so I have two speeds. I have namaste and I'll cut a bitch. <laughs> so if, if I go out for a drink, I'm having 15 drinks, not because I want to get drunk, just because there's drinks. Okay, so the basic premise is you can't, I can't moderate. So if I can't moderate, I have to shut down. So I quit drinking 16 months ago because I don't know how to moderate. You have to understand yourself. If you don't know yourself and you don't take care of yourself first, you can't do anything to help other people. You want to be better, it has to start with making yourself better. 16 months ago, I woke up, I said, this is bullshit, I feel like crap, and you know what? We work in the social space, in the past 14 years, I've lost three friends to suicide. It is a tough industry, 
where we tend to work alone, we don't talk to a lot of people, for God's sake, call someone. You're not doing this alone. You never have to. That's my number, for Christ's sake. Reach out to me. Seriously. You're not in this alone. If you don't take care of the oxygen mask theory, you have to put on your own mask before you help other people. Last rule, um, have a support team. Have people who you work with. I run a mastermind group. It's called Shank Minds. I'm not pitching it, but have a group. Have a bunch of people who you know, who you trust, who you can run shit by, because like I said, it's a lonely industry, and when people don't understand what you do, it makes it even worse. I was dating a woman, I couldn't complain about my day, because she's like, oh yeah, really tough. You're working at home, or you're on a beach somewhere, in a meeting, and having, you're speaking really tough. You know, I was like, bitch, I was working harder than you! <laughs> understand that you have to find people just like you to understand what you're doing. Do the job no one wants. You do the job no one wants, and I see that, I will hire you. Um, last point, give out 10 times in the universe, 10 times the amount of help you give out for every one time you ask. Okay, for any time you ask for help, give out 10 times first. That way when you email me wanting something, I don't see it as the first time I've heard for you in five years. Okay, lastly, how to do all this? Have systems in place to help you based on what you do. I live and die on uh, RunKeeper. Okay, if I don't exercise every day, I'm useless. I rely on RunKeeper, <clears throat> my, um, my fitness pal, Why Things. Uh, download an app called Productive. It, beeps at me until I, until I work out. Have a system in place that works for you. And here's the thing, resolutions fail, rituals succeed. Finally, this is probably what you can take away from all this. People with means distribute opportunities to people they trust. Become the person people trust. PeterShankman.com, that's my cell phone number. Notes from PS is my uh, mailing list, at Peter Shankman on all the socials. Thanks, guys.